Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. These days, clowns tend to get involved. We've got that story, plus no more pillow talk. But first, let me say again a huge thanks to you, James Corbett, for an amazing time in Japan. Had a fantastic time. You were an amazing, gracious host for me and my wife. We had an amazing time. And now here we are, back 10 years, you know, plus one here on New World Next Week. The crazy thing was, we made it out 24 hours ahead of the latest typhoons and earthquakes. All the all the flights behind us were canceling. We were even kind of checking to see that we were going to be okay to get out in time. And we were out in time. And again, you know, it's it's running from things that, again, we booked this trip months and months and months in advance. Having the sort of luck of 24 hours, I, I really can't explain. Seeing cities like Beijing and Guangzhou on the departures board in the airport made me again think of just how small the world really is, James. While I was able to kind of stay for the most part off of the news during the trip, I don't really have a cell phone, so that makes it easy to be off of the news. I did see a couple of stories about how everybody from mega DJs to NBA teams, and especially the head of Hong Kong, None of those folks can escape the influence of most favored nation, James. The latest I got for you, Hong Kong leader jeered out of legislative council during policy speech. This coming from the Epoch Times and everything we say and play always included in your show notes. Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam was forced to abandon her annual policy address after some lawmakers jeered as she began speaking. That's a nice word for being shouted at, causing an unprecedented cancellation of the speech in the legislature of the Chinese-ruled city. Lam, who has rejected calls to stand down, have been set to announce a whole raft of policy initiatives in a bid to restore confidence in her administration after over four months of pretty large anti-government protests. Pro-democracy lawmakers shouted five demands, not one less, as they heckled Carrie Lam, who faces immense pressure to regain trust and resolve the city's biggest political crisis in decades in a disruption that forced the meeting to be adjourned not once but twice. And I think she pretty much resorted to doing the thing by video address a little bit later. The expression has become one of the movement's rallying calls, referring to protesters' five main demands, which include universal suffrage, and an independent inquiry into what they say has been excessive force by the cops in dealing with protesters. Some of the lawmakers wore masks of Chinese leader Xi Jinping inside the chamber as they held up posters calling for the five demands to be met. James Elsewhere of China Daily is saying that the Hong Kong cops are claiming that rioters are planning to use lethal weapon attacks against the cops. Of course, saying, oh, we're going to be attacked by folks. More info on the on the DJs and the NBA teams, James. This was the bit that I saw on Twitter while we were visiting in Japan. Mega DJ Zed confirms Chinese government forced promoters to cancel his show because he liked a South Park tweet. And meanwhile, the Houston Rockets, the general manager of this NBA basketball team, what he's doing on the official Twitter account saying political things like we stand with Hong Kong is that I won't understand why mega millionaire businesses don't realize yet that they can't act this way, essentially, in the big, brave new world order. Houston Rockets general manager tweets about China and pretty much loses the whole Houston Rockets relationship with most favored nation. James, that's uh, the most up to date I can give us of what's going on over there in Hong Kong. What do you got? Well, it is, uh, just on a side note, it is interesting to note the ways that culture and pop culture are impinged uh, upon by these political events. And it just goes to show that more and more the corporate structure of the U.S. entertainment industry is wedded to China. And uh, I'm not holding my breath for any Hollywood execs to come out, you know, denouncing China, Chinese move, government moves, because, of course, they know what side their bread is buttered on. So it's interesting to see how that has basically taken taken such a huge proportion of uh, U.S. entertainment um, uh, revenue in the past decade. Uh, so that's that in and of itself is an interesting phenomenon. But if you go and watch the actual footage of uh, Carrie Lam being jeered out of the, uh, the Hong Kong Council and then having to deliver the video address, you'll see in, in her video address that she eventually did deliver via video uh, that she was fretting about the situation, obviously, in Hong Kong and asked the question, will Hong Kong return to normal? Which is a good question, but of course it raises the further question, well, what is normal at this point? Of course, Hong Kong is still a special administrative region 
under the umbrella of the People's Republic of China, under the One Nation, Two Systems rule that was set up for the handover in 1997, which is supposed to pertain till 2047. But obviously that, uh, that the meaning of that, what is a special administrative region and how is it being administered and under what rules and who gets to decide is exactly what the point of all these protests are about. And in any normal, rational world, you would think the, yes, the people of Hong Kong should be the ones to decide what is happening in Hong Kong. But of course, we do not live in a normal, rational world. We live in clown world. So we have things like the U.S. House of Representatives just passing the U.S., no, the, the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, I believe, question mark. Not to be confused with the Hong Kong... Policy Act in the early 1990s, which essentially says the same thing, which says we will treat Hong Kong separately from China in trade deals and, and fi finance deals and others, uh, as long as China keeps its mitts off of Hong Kong. And now they're saying with this new act, uh, basically Congress will have to reapprove the Hong Kong's special status every single year. Um, basically saying, China, if you try to do anything too drastic, we're going to stop using Hong Kong as the international financial trading hub that it is, and you'll lose a lifeline to the international uh, markets. So it is, it is a big threat that's being wielded right now, but as people, even former Trump insiders, have said, well, this is really targeting the wrong people. You're targeting the people of Hong Kong with this big threat if China decides to crack down on them. I mean, it doesn't seem to make sense from that perspective. It's also another example of how this, what is happening in Hong Kong isn't about the Hong Kongers. It isn't about what they think or what they want to have happen. It's about China and the U.S., and this is just a proxy war, like we've seen so many times uh, at least in the past century, really over the centuries, but certainly we could think back to the Cold War and all of those nations that were used as essentially proxy wars in a big Cold War and Vietnam and the domino effect and all of that. And then, you know, we got to stand in Korea and divide that nation permanently against itself so that, you know, families are divided along this arbitrary line that we've fought for and all of this. So this is, this is the state that we're in. And just a few weeks ago on This Week in Money, I was saying, you know, I don't think fundamentally this protest movement is going to be the movement that, that causes anything drastic to happen, that either topples China or topples the Hong Kong uh, government as we know it right now. But as it continues to drag out and continues to escalate, uh, it, the possibility comes, becomes more and more that this will be a sort of flashpoint, or at least will be engineered and pressed into being a flashpoint for future geopolitics. So all eyes on Hong Kong right now. It is an important event that's taking place there right now. And of course, there are outside manipulations that are trying to ramp things up for their own geopolitical benefit. And ha again, it has nothing to do with the people of Hong Kong at this point. It's a small, brave new world after all, James. We will take a trip to Clown World on this New World Next Week episode 388. There's a, a producer sidebar note. I am counting our 10th anniversary episode as a canon New World Next Week episode. So we're calling this episode 388. We will go to Clown World, but first, no more pillow talk. We gotta gotta take a trip to the bedroom, James. Phones in bed, taking a toll on relationships and sex lives. We have heard this, and you've maybe even seen it in your friends and family in your own life. More research coming out proving what we've already seen. The bedroom is traditionally used for two primary purposes for adults, sleeping and romance. However, the advent of smartphones has seemingly changed that with nearly three quarters of surveyed Americans admitting they bring their phone to bed with them. Unsurprisingly, all of that between the sheet screen time is having an adverse effect on many people's relationships. The poll surveyed 2,000 Americans on their phone habits and found that people who regularly bring their phone to bed are two times more likely to use their device than engage in romantic activity with their partner during the hour before they fall asleep. Respondents said phone time was the number one activity listed for their last hour spent awake each night. Another 25% of respondents say the last thing they see each night before closing their eyes is their phone, not their spouse or their loved one. Even when it's time to go to sleep, 93% of Americans sleep with their phone within arm's reach and almost 10% sleep with their phone under the pillow. I, I had the radio under my pillow as a little kid, but it was, you know, only getting in one or two stations and I was doing it because I would get in trouble. The idea of now that I would hide something under my pillow. This is we're this is, we're in 2019, James. 93% of Americans sleep with their phone within arm's reach and 10% admit to having it under their pillow. 
again, that kind of it brings up, you know, the things we put under our pillow, the tooth fairy, all these things. It's now sort of the technology has infected our, our, our daily mythology even. Much of this behavior seems to be due to people's need to, as I add, ironically, be connected at all times. With 73% of respondents saying they feel inclined to be on their phone at all hours of the day and night. James, aside from the irony of, I need to be connected, so I'll push this physical human away from me and keep this phone next to me, which, as we know, is mostly filled with all kinds of bots and things. James, you served this one up. Why, why did this story grab your attention? Well, well, first, let me just parenthetically comment, James. I thought, as an American, you'd have to sleep with an M16 under your pillow. <laughs> At least that's what I'm given to believe. But, uh, uh, yes, just on a health note, please do not sleep with a microwave radiation device right under your head like that. Please do not do that, okay? Anyone in the audience. Anyway, um, I, I find this to be a fascinating story because it says a lot of things about human nature itself, let alone about the current state that we find ourselves in, how quickly this technology has become so normalized. One decade ago, smartphones were these crazy futuristic sci-fi devices. Wow, look, I have this thing at my fingertips and I can do all this blah, blah, blah. And now it's just the thing that you take everywhere and it literally sleeps with you. It's everywhere you go. Um, that to me speaks volumes about how quickly human beings can be conditioned into a new normal. And it makes me wonder, one decade from now, you know, how much more insidious and how much more pervasive will these types of technologies be? But also, it obviously speaks to the fact that uh, the habituation of this technology in our lives is affecting our human relationships. And perhaps no more stark example of that than in the bedroom, where people are taking their phones to bed and interacting with them. Now, look, I would say there are three things that adults do in the bedroom. One would be sleeping, two would be romance, and three would be reading books. I mean, I've always read books in bed, so I, I, you could say, oh, it's just the same thing, but it really isn't. I mean, not only the physical effects of looking at that, uh, that uh, blue light before you go to sleep, which disrupts your sleeping patterns and all of that, but also uh, the, the sort of the nature of the 24-7 scroll feed, which as we've talked about many times was specifically designed to keep you addicted and keep you scrolling. You can sit there with a phone for hours, whereas if you're with a book, you know, maybe you last an hour before you doze off to sleep. There is an actual physical difference with it. So um, it, is, it is extremely dangerous. And I think this is something that in some sense is, is like a test. I mean, can you at least kick the habit enough to say, I'm not going to bring my phone to bed? I mean, that would be the one first step towards admitting that this is an addiction and a problem and that you can kick it. Because if you can't do that, then chances are you're in too deep with the whole smartphone phenomenon. I am pleased to, uh, to announce, as I've always said, my next phone will be a flip phone. My current phone is dying. It's all, almost unable to hold a charge for a single day. So I, I'm right on the edge of getting rid of it and good riddance because uh, honestly, even with myself, I find myself staring at that news feed, scrolling along. Oh, what should we look at for New World next week, this week? And I'm always looking at the phone. No, not anymore. It's going out the window. And I encourage people to at least take that first step of stop taking your phone to bed. At least see if you can do that. And that might be a way of hoping, ho hopefully breaking some of these bad habits that we're getting into. Now, I think, uh, remember Homer Simpson mentioned some of those things, sleeping, I think he mentioned eating, but he also mentioned making a little fort as well. So you can do that. <laughs> Bed. Remember, what did we just talk about uh, on a very recent episode? Elites don't let their kids use smartphones, and schools now getting rid of them entirely because they've realized it's not actually helping them study and learn by any stretch. James, I bet that one of the, one of the reasons the phones stay in so much, and one of the quickest reasons people would say, well, I can't, it's my alarm. We all got rid of our alarm clocks and what we essentially have. I, I've got a version of it myself. You dock the thing into a new alarm clock that can kick off this or that. So that's one of the reasons the phone kind of stays ubiquitous is, is now it is people's alarms. It's interesting to see the, the fangsters and Apple and the rest implementing these things that show you how much time you're using on the phone. You may now see this screen time. Oh, here's how much time you've been on your phone. It was nice to look on it, you know, when we were traveling in Japan. It was like, oh, your screen time's down 64%. <laughs> like, ah, that, that's a good thing. 
James, uh, we'll have to continue to see how this, uh, you know, continues. And again, mentioning the, the trip in Japan, there were a lot of folks there on cell phones every single place. Now, that's the first, you know, cities I've been in in quite some time. I'm sure it's the same situation over in New York and in Los Angeles as well. Having said all that, it's finally time to go to Clown Town, James. It looks like, again, Halloween's pretty much made it into Japan now. The stores were all filled with it. You can't escape it, and it's even on your own shows, James Corbett. Scary clowns are everywhere. This article from theweek.com asks and says maybe you didn't notice the arrival of the clowns. At first, it was just a clown or two here or there, a few bizarre local news headlines, scattered jokes on Twitter, and then seemingly overnight clowns were everywhere that was back in 2016 a year that of course now safely behind us can be characterized by its burbling undercurrent of hysteria we could be forgiven then for our irrational coolrophobia fear of clowns for our phantom sightings of big red noses and pasty white faces but the terrifying truth is clowns never really went away now in 2019, they've taken over our mega entertainment as an eerily apt metaphor for the way we live now, which makes this year's glut even more noticeable, unifying sinister element to all the clowns. So we'll go back in time. The creepy clown trope actually goes back over a century, and some claim it goes even further back, but it goes back at least to 1892's Pagliacci, the, the crying clown opera, which ends with, spoiler, the clown murdering his wife. To the ire of some professional clowns, the creepy clown is now more ubiquitous than the friendly clown. Just to poke into any Halloween store, we'll show you. Now, of course, It, Chapter 2, The Clown Eats Kids. The Joker, the new Joaquin Phoenix movie, he's a murder clown. Remember also that the feds were hyping a shooter event for the release of that latest Joker film. Of course, echoing the Dark Knight things that we went through back in 2012. The clown in Clown... The cleverly titled movie tries to burn kids alive and Disney Shia LaBeouf appears in his rodeo clown clothes and makeup in a film called Honey Boy. Well, that's an echo of his suppressed childhood trauma. Clowns 2019 seem to instruct us that they are not our friends. The New York Times even said just last month in September, these days when people are angry on the Internet, clowns tend to get involved. Now, as I actually said on our year-end 2016 episode, New World Next Year 2017, as our buddy Lauren Coleman had noted, note how quickly the clowns disappeared post-election. And he is talking about, of course, that catalyzing catastrophic 2012 America's Next Top President event, which they tried to sigh up you into believing was like a 9-11 a event. So our friends and colleagues like Lauren Coleman and, of course, Clyde Lewis have done a ton of work on the creepy clown phenomena Clyde basically getting into the history of clowns as being corpse paint. They are painted up like a bloated, dead body. So that's a lot of fun. We're all clowns on this bus, and Clyde even did an episode two nights ago. Clown war culture explaining the killing joke. And the last little extra bit, because you maybe have seen this around in your interneting, Clown World became a meme as some sort of update on Pepe the Frog, and that's all happened over here in the last year or so, as again, the fake right likes to call the fake left Clown World, and, and they're not wrong. James, here we are again in Clown World 2019. Exactly right. And really, I just brought up this story because I wanted to see what you'd say about it. I know you've covered this in the past, and I'm going to be checking into those references that you've uh, dug up there because it is it is fascinating just from a psychological or collective unconscious level or whatever it is that's creating these memes and uh, and how it ties into the clown world meme, which I referenced earlier and which you've uh, referenced right there. So there's definitely something happening. But as you saw when you were here in Japan, I'm fairly detached from American pop culture goings on, so I'm not sure I f connect with this idea so much myself personally. I don't know about these new movies and, and things like this, and I'm not going to go see Joker or whatever else, but I just thought it was interesting, and probably there's uh, something of deeper significance there, so I'm going to be checking into those links that you mentioned. It is, I mean... It I think on the simplest level, we can just say, ah, people will imitate anything anymore that they think will get some attention in this new Internet world. And that, I think, is completely true. But the fact that we sort of come back to these 
you know, what people find fundamentally frightening. Some people say, you know, clowns are scarier than giving a public speech or of even death itself, which some have admitted in polls. So, James, we are, what, two weeks away here from Halloween and pretty much turns into sort of a, a scary time, which which we notice always kind of ties in with the fake selections that come the following week. So, James, I'll, I'll stay on top of clown world for you. In Thank you. <laughs> As, as I like to always say, I stream news, music, memes, and more Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Mountain Time at my own website, MediaMonarchy.com. I've been doing it for over 14 years. It has been fantastic to see all the new folks and all the new subscribers and signups and supporters from people who, again, have maybe watched New World Next Week for a decade and maybe finally were like, they, they, I think, James, we, we've helped them appreciate it. So I appreciate all those folks that have signed up to now support Media Monarchy, James. And I'd like to thank them, too. And let's remind those new signups to Media Monarchy and any new signups to CorbettReport.com that at this weekend's newsletter on CorbettReport.com, I'm going to be uh, playing our What's in Your Bag that we recorded. And uh, I'll be handing off the, the flip version where you ask me what's in my bag for MediaMonarchy.com members. And uh, we'll get those posted up in the near future for any new signups. So... Please do support the work. Looking forward to doing it again next week. James, thanks so much. All right, buddy. Thanks. Take care.